Hello everyone, welcome to Filmhead. Let's talk about the top 5 sci-fi film that you should watch. 65. A pilot and a little girl become left on Earth in the science fiction novel 65, which takes place 65 million years in the past. Now, they must do whatever it takes to survive in this unknown terrain that is infested with bloodthirsty prehistoric creatures and a fast-approaching asteroid. 65 million years ago when Earth was yet undiscovered by humans. They spoke in English but inhabited some other planet. So, when Mills, Adam Driver, crash lands on Earth, he quickly finds his footing and breath, but is challenged by some mighty dinosaurs, who rule the planet. He finds himself stuck with a little girl Koa, Ariana Greenblatt, who needs to be escorted back to her home planet. To make matters worse, she doesn't speak his language and constantly reminds him of his own daughter, who is no longer alive. The movie's main character, Adam, is a parody of a modern boy. He is the first man on Earth, speaks flawless English, and fights off enormous monsters on his own without the need of any kind of special abilities. In actuality, it is a ridiculous concept that appears to have been hastily thrown into this enormous visual extravaganza. The creators may not have realized how crucial it was to make it look convincing because they put so much work into making it seem believable, and a lot of it does. Beck and Woods offer some clever camera work here and there, but also some erratic editing choices. And they borrow quite a bit from the Jurassic Park franchise, a giant footprint in the mud or a dinosaur's yellow eye leering menacingly through a window. But maybe that's inevitable at this point. Their film only gets truly enjoyably nutty toward the end, with its climactic combination of a sneaky quicksand patch, a ravenous Tyrannosaurus Rex, a well-timed geyser eruption, and a catastrophic asteroid shower. But by then, it's too late for us and the planet. What it needed was an emotionally moving narrative and a consistently action-packed execution. Adam Miller and Ariana Greenblatt give a strictly passable performance, which is also due to the soullessness of the script. The film is the strongest when the dinosaurs are in action, killing and getting killed. But then again, this is no Jurassic Park. No amount of Dino Terror comes even close to what Steven Spielberg gave us back in the 90s. 65 Foot is pegged as an ultimate survival saga from eons ago, but surviving this underwhelming thriller felt like a million years, literally. Godzilla Minus One Godzilla Minus One, a Japanese movie that directed by Takashi Yamazaki sets his destroyer of worlds against a post-war Japan still recovering from the effects of the A-bomb with the little people left to work out how to save themselves. Once more, Shikishima is prevented from defending herself by terror when the island is overrun by the well-known monster Godzilla, which kills almost all of the inhabitants. When Shikishima goes home, his parents are dead and his house is a pile of matchsticks after Tokyo was completely destroyed by allied firebombing. Nevertheless, he creates a fictitious family out of a young woman named Nariko Minami Hamabe, who had lost everything, and a kid named Akiko subsequently, when he was three years old, charmingly portrayed by Sae Nagatani, whom Nariko was tasked with raising after witnessing Akiko's mother perish in a bomb shelter. Years pass, and this little nuclear family looks poised to benefit from the post-war phoenix-like recovery of the nation. But there are other kinds of nuclear force at play here, especially in the Bikini Atoll where the H-bomb is tested. In the original Godzilla movie, the big bad horror was the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by Oppenheimer and Kose bomb, along with anxieties about the nuclear testing in the Pacific. Cited in the film as a contributing factor to Godzilla's genetic mutation, Godzilla Minus One is obviously Toho's attempt at foregrounding their Scaly Stars character as a spectacular and traditional crowd-pleaser. The main character, Koichi Shikishima, was a pilot-turned-kamikaze pilot who abandoned his duty at the end of the war and then soon after encountered Godzilla on a Japanese outpost island. His guilt and PTSD drag him into a cycle of misery and selfishness after the war, preventing him from connecting to his new family, comprised of Nariko Oishi, Minami Hamabe, a young woman he meets in the rubble, and little Akiko. S.A.E. Nagatani, an infant Nariko is raising. Godzilla Minus One is driven by these connections, and although the Godzilla content is thrilling and terrifying and our hero's strategy for taking down the monster is rather inventive and resourceful. The screenplay is what sets this movie apart from all the other recent attempts to bring Godzilla to the big screen. It turns out that a $200 million movie with shoddy writing and one-dimensional. Generic characters you forget about the moment you leave the cinema is far less effective than a well-written script with nuanced characters you truly care about with a $15 million budget. Another lesson is that if you have a good plot, 
you do not need to spend tens of millions on famous actors. There are many talented actors in the world. Transformers Rise of the Beasts Though Transformers Rise of the Beasts is still a gigantic space robot movie with a lot of profanity and collisions, it is still better than most of the franchise's releases. However, Rise of the Beasts shows a surprisingly compassionate side toward the people ensnared in this titanic struggle between good and evil, which is what makes it bearable for the majority of viewers. That is unusual for this series, which is better recognized for the drab characters and cringeworthy dialogue of the Bay flicks. The screenplay, which is credited to five people, allows Dominique Fishback and the likable Anthony Ramos to craft characters that we could even find endearing. The Rise of the Beasts pulls together characters from both the far-flung past and the distant future. It's primarily set in 1994 and tells, shockingly, the story of how an unsuspecting human ends up becoming one of the most important participants in a long-standing Cybertronian war. As a young army veteran, all Noah Diaz really wants is to find a job to be able to support his little brother Chris and their mom Brianna. With steady work being hard to come by, though, it makes more sense for Noah to get into boosting cars with his buddy Reek than to sit around waiting for recruiter calls that simply aren't coming in. Back on Earth in Rise of the Beasts, we're given the sparse group of tired human characters and a setup straight out of an old TV after-school special, with Anthony Ramos as Noah Diaz, a former military electronics engineer living in Brooklyn trying to get a job to help pay for his sick little brother's mounting medical bills. Then, Dominique Fishback plays Elena Wallace, a young research assistant at a museum who, despite having barely graduated from high school, seems to know everything there is to know about symbology, archaeology, physics, art, history, linguistics, metallurgy, and maybe even more. Predictably, Elena finds half of the trans warp key concealed inside an antiquated sculpture. She then joins forces with Noah and his Autobot companions to locate the remaining half of the key in a Peruvian temple before their home planet is threatened. It is all incredibly fabricated content, as is frequently the tragic situation with screenplays that have been pieced together by almost six writers. The story of the movie tinkers for much too long with its little cast of human characters before settling into some fun Cybertronian showdowns between the Autobots and the Terracons, who are powered by dark energy. For a battle royale set in the lush Peruvian rainforests, Rise of the Beasts is inoffensive at best and completely contrived at its worst, a forgettable offering in the rebooted Transformers. Franchise that seems only to serve as a tower construct to present the Hasbro Cinematic Universe and its first crossover foray into the G.I. Joe territory. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom There is only one hero in the DC expanded universe of films, which seems to be coming to an end, and that is Aquaman. He is the only one who, in addition to knowing how ludicrous he is, always seems to be having fun. Specifically, that's Aquaman is played by Jason Momoa who refashioned the half-human prince and later king of Atlantis, a.k. Arthur Curry, as a brawny, long-haired, beer-chugging, high-fiving, wise-cracking bro who bears quite a bit of resemblance to an actor named Jason Momoa. The queen of Atlantis is Mara, played by Amber Heard, an actor whose steadfastness in standing up to online male bullies has to be respected, and Dolph Lundgren is once again Aquaman's father-in-law Nereus. Willem Dafoe, who kept his self-respect in the last film playing Aquaman's mentor Volko, doesn't appear, but Nicole Kidman shows up again, taking the DC shilling as Aquaman's willowy and distraught mother Atlanta. The film is worth seeing primarily because of Momoa. He is as maverick, action star-like and alpha cool as they come, almost like a jerk, but he also gives you the impression that his character is essentially good-hearted, recognizes when he has crossed a line, and truly regrets it. He also has range. Momoa can be seen providing his own smart talicky running commentary on the movie he is in one minute, and then, as if he were performing in a silent movie melodrama with title cards. He will cry bitter tears or shout out in agony or vindictive wrath over some evil action by a bad character. The second best reason to see the film is Momoa's chemistry with his co-star Patrick Wilson, returning as Arthur's half-brother ORM Marius, aka the Ocean Master the deposed would-be king of Atlantis and Arthur's chief rival in the first movie. Wilson seems to have been warped into contemporary Hollywood from a much earlier decade. He has a Van Heflin quality in this one. Almost two-thirds of this sequel's playtime is likely spent with Arthur and ORM engaging in their typical arguing buddy on a mission antics, sprinkled with bits of reconciliation between separated siblings, redemption story, and learning from mistakes in order to progress. 
One never pulls off an action scene as virtuosic as the leaping across rooftops fight in the first Aquaman, but there are some good ones in here, choreographed. Framed and edited with Juan's characteristic clarity even when the camera is shaking like an astronaut during liftoff. A few of them play out from a distance with our spec-sized heroes racing through vistas packed with gigantic creatures, machines, armored warriors, jagged rocks, fire, and ice. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 It all starts with an attack. The golden-hued Adam Warlock comes speeding into nowhere, pummeling everything in sight with strength that would impress Superman. Rocket takes the worst beating and hovers near death for most of the movie, putting the film on two tracks, a flashback to Rocket's origin story and the present-day tale of the Guardians trying to save him. The mission leads them to the High Evolutionary, a mad scientist who tried to speed up the evolutionary process for a utopia called Counter-Earth and created Rocket all those years ago. Director and co-writer James Gunn uses the tried-and-true, heart-wrenching method of putting cute creatures in danger, delving into Rocket the Raccoon's painful past and touching on some shockingly dark themes, eugenics and vivisection, in order to do this. There is a similarity between this image and Bong Joon-ho's Okja, both highlight friendship and commitment while simultaneously exposing humanity's horrific violence toward other animals. The action turns on friendship as a prime motive to undertake a dangerous mission, which quickly builds another sentimental strut into the action. In order to get inside Orgacorp, the Guardians need the help of one of their former number, Gamoroth, Zoe Saldana, who turns out to be a simulated duplicate of her former self. In Volume 3, Gunn includes a number of clashes to liven up the action. The blue-tinted, robotic guardian Nebula, Karen Gillan, and Gamora are rival adopted siblings. Nebula's main job is to pretend to be in love with Peter and react with a low-pitched growl whenever Gamora approaches him. This time, there is Cosmo, a guardian dog who was trained in the Soviet space program and has speech-related superpowers. She is voiced by Maria Bakalova. Another creature composed of a tree trunk and branches, Groot, voiced by Vin Diesel, Austin Freeman plays him on set, has an incomprehensibly large variety of superpowers but barely says anything. We now learn that Rocket was part of the High Evolutionary's hideous experiments. Incidentally, director James Gunn has likened the High Evolutionary to a space version of Dr. Morrow, which sounds about right. Rocket is gravely injured after Adam's attack, and the Guardians cannot treat him as it would activate a kill switch. The essence of Volume 3 is simulation. The simulation of a romantic relationship, of the power of identity, of high-stakes pursuits, of the danger of battle. The violence of the movie is, for the most part, absurd, inasmuch as the rules of bodies and the powers of superheroes remain undefined and infinitely malleable to fit the demands of a given plot point. The movie's production design, by Beth Mickle, is the only real source of inspiration. Details like the biomorphic squish of Orgosphere's terrain, Orgacorp's enormous wall of biomaterial balls and storage, and the Counter-Earth suburb imitations allude to a decorative realm of futuristic fascinations that Gunn's direction schemes over. There are as many kinds of good images as there are good images, but what they have in common is mystery, the need to turn one's head, shift one's eyes, to look outside or behind them for their many meanings and implications.